So um, next, I wanted to dive a little bit into uh, ZFS send and receive. So uh, I'm going to talk about like what is this thing? Why would you want to use it? Um, how does it compare to other tools that that solve similar problems? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about you know how it works. Like how did we design it to to, to be better than these other tools? Um, and then I'll be talking about um, new features uh, since. Um, 2010, and then some <coughs> upcoming slash almost done, almost integrated features like uh, resumable send and receive. <coughs> so uh, what do you use this thing for? Um, ZFS send is a command that it serializes the contents of a snapshot and allows you, and, and basically it just like dumps out the con contents of that snapshot um, on the standard out. And the, the key thing about it is that you can create incremental send streams between two different snapshots. Um, so uh, you can periodically say, okay, send all the changes since the previous snapshot to the current time um, to a remote system, and then use ZFS receive to recreate that snapshot. So the primary use case for this is remote replication. Um, so you can use this uh, replica replication for like disaster recovery or failover. Um, you know, you might have the other machine like in a different data center. Um, and I'll also, you can use it for data distribution. Um, so like I have one master node where I'm putting my new content and then I need to distribute that content to a bunch of different machines that are um, you know, consuming it or serving it out you know, to, other, uh, to other customers, other clients. Um, it can also be used for backup um, as well. So here's an example of um, just how you would use this on the command line. Um, so in this case, we're doing a, a full a full send of this of this snapshot pool slash fs at Monday. Pipe the output to another machine over SSH and then into ZFS receive. So now we're going to create on the t on the uh, target machine this new file system receive slash fs. Now. Um, when the next day comes around, we can do an incremental by s doing ZFS send dash I and then the, the first snapshot. So the we, we're basically saying the other machine already has the Monday snapshot and now I want to send them the Tuesday snapshot based on uh, knowing that they already have what's from Monday, just send them the differences <coughs> and then SSH that to ZFS receive. So in terms of terminology, um, sometimes I'll call this the from snap because we're sending from that snapshot to this two snap snapshot. So there's a lot of other tools that can kind of do similar things. Um, so you know why would you use ZFS send to receive? Um, you know like rsync basically uh, does this. It works on any file system, any server, any platform. Um, you know why would you bother with like a specific tool like this? So uh, then I think probably the number one reason is performance. Um, especially performance of incremental uh, sends. So the uh, ZFS send and receive, it uses the internal ZFS uh, on disk format to be able to very quickly locate um, just the changed blocks without having to look at every file or every block. Um, so if you compare this, where is it? Yeah. If you compare this with tools like rsync, they need to look at every file to see if that file was changed. And if the file uh, might have been uh, uh, only partially modified, so like if it was a VMDK image or like a database where you, you're modifying just certain blocks of it, then you know, rsync has to look at every block to determine whether that block is the same on the target system as the sending system. ZFS um, only needs to look at uh, basically O of the number of blocks that were actually changed in order to find those changed blocks and send them to the other system. Okay, so as the end result of that, um, we're able to use the full um, IOPS and bandwidth of the storage. Uh, we're able to use the full bandwidth of the network. And um, the latent, the I think this is kind of the key thing, is that the latency of both the storage and the latency of the network has no impact on the performance of send and receive. So you can be going over like a, a really sl slow WAN link that has you know hundreds of milliseconds of latency, but as long as you have sufficient bandwidth, um, it's going to perform great. And this is also in contrast to things like rsync that needs a lot of communication between the two nodes um, in order to sort out what things were changed. Um, so 
Another key thing about ZFS Send and Receive is that it maintains the block sharing um, between ZFS snapshots and clones. So if, if you're already using snapshots and clones um, as part of your uh, product or as part of your administrative practices, um, ZFS Send and Receive, using that for replication, allows you to have those same snapshots and clones on the remote system with the same block sharing versus with tools like rsync, if you wanted to have like both the data from yesterday and the data from today, you'd have to send two whole different copies to the remote system, which is really impractical. And lastly, um, it ZFS Send and Receive is very complete in that it captures all of the semantic um, state of your file system. So even kind of weird Z ZPL specific features like um, like uh, Windows, SID owners, and crazy NFS v4 ACLs, all that is captured um, without needing any special code to um, be updated whenever one of these things is added. Okay, so that's kind of a, that's a big, big, big promise there. Um, so next I'll talk a little bit about like what are the, how did we accomplish that? Like what were the design decisions that allowed us to get, um, you know, that great performance um, and, uh, and other features. So um, we locate the change blocks using the birth time, which is uh, part of the ZFS on disk uh, format. And I'll talk about that in, uh, in a little bit. Um, we use prefetching to issue lots of IOs in parallel. So when you're doing a ZFS send, uh, we're actually issuing lots and lots of IOs in parallel so that it, uh, if you have lots of disks, then we're able to take advantage of the full bandwidth of all of those disks rather than just querying one file at a time. Um, and ZFS send and receive is unidirectional. So we're only sending data from the sender to the receiver. The receiver doesn't have to send any um, information back to the sender. So basically we can go at the full uh, bandwidth of whatever of a TCP connection or whatever uh, your underlying transport is. Um, and, and then lastly, it's built on top of the DMU which means that um, any kind of com complexity that's implemented in the ZPL or ZVOL layers um, is just kind of naturally abstracted out and we don't have to worry about that at all in, in ZFS send and receive. So I think um, locating the incremental changes is kind of one of the more interesting aspects of ZFS send and receive. <coughs> so uh, I kind of talked about this a little bit. Let me show you the diagram. So the key thing here is to, to look at the incremental change, we only have to look at the two snap. In other words, the snapshot that we're actually sending. Um, and all that we need to know is what time was the from snap created. So here we know in this example, we're saying that the from snap was in TXV3. Uh, oh, the from snap is in TXV5. So we need to find all the changes that happened since time five. Um, and to do that, we look at this tree of blocks, and uh, this is how all the data is represented on disk, where the, uh, the data, the user data is in these leaf blocks, and then these, inter these uh, interior nodes are called indirect blocks, and they point to other blocks. Mm -hmm. And as part of the pointer, it, it also knows what time the uh, block that it's pointing to was written. And because ZFS is copy on write, we know that um, whenever we modify a block, we have to modify all of the ancestor blocks all the way up the tree. So that means that <coughs> if we modify this block, then the birth his birth time is six. We know that all of its ancestors have to be six or later. They can't be earlier than six because we couldn't have modified this without modifying the parents. <coughs> so uh, in order to find the changed blocks, which are the ones that we need to send, we look at the birth time and we compare it to the birth time of the uh, of the from snap, which is five. So here we look at this is this is born at time three. So we know nothing below here could be born after time three. So therefore, we don't have to look at any of these blocks um, because they're all born before time five. This one was born after time five, so we have to read the block that it points to, and then look at it, the birth times inside of it, and so on down the tree. And we find that you know this block was modified after time five. This one was not and these two were modified after time five. So in the end, we'll end up sending just these three data blocks. And um, you know, in this simplistic case, we had to read uh, you know, four 
metadata blocks to, to get it, but uh, in reality, this tends to be, uh, you know, the, the number of blocks read here is much, much greater because there's actually like 100 pointers rather than just the two that I could fit on the slide. Um, any questions about this? What is ZPL? You mentioned ZPL. Oh yeah. So the ZPL is the ZFS POSIX layer. Um, let's see how quickly we can get there. So uh, it's this layer here. Basically, the uh, the the virtual file system layer talks to the ZPL, and the ZPL um, is responsible for things like file ownership, file size, permissions, um, directories, uh, you know, symbolic links, all those kind of like file type things. Um, but it's not responsible for, uh, it basically, this um, interface allows it to make atomic transactions on objects. Objects are kind of like a, uh, a file without any attributes. So um, this, <laughs> this layer is like, it's complicated because there's a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of nitty gritty details in implementing um, permissions and things <laughs> like that. But we've isolated that complexity from the, complexity of actually like how do you structure a file? How do you get a, a block pointer that points to other blocks and how do you manipulate that tree of blocks that I showed you later? So that tree of blocks is all managed by the DMU. Um, so, all, so everything that um, ZFS send and receive is dealing with is like kind of interacting at this, this layer. It doesn't need to know about anything that's happening above it. Thank you. Any other questions about this? Yes. So basically, <laughs> all the ZFS attributes on one call or something will be sent on the transaction, right? Yeah, so, so you're you were talking about the uh, attributes, more or less. Yeah, so like uh, file attributes. So okay. that includes things like um, extended attributes and you know owners and permissions and things like that, mm -hmm. the file mode, all that kind of stuff. Other questions? Cool, so um, I mentioned, great, so I mentioned um, we issue lots of IOs at once in order to take advantage of the full IOPS of all of the disks that are attached to the system. So the way that, we're ab that we do that is um, when you run ZFS send, it's actually creating an additional thread that's a prefetch thread that's basically running out ahead of the main thread and issuing um, IOs, prefetch IOs for um, all of that whole tree of blocks. The, the key way that it's able to stay ahead of the, the main thread, that's actually the main thread is the one that's actually pushing the data um, out on standard output and then you know over over the network connection is that uh, the prefetch thread doesn't have to wait for the data blocks to be read in. So it does have to wait for the indirect blocks to be read in so that it knows what data blocks to prefetch underneath it. But for the data blocks, it just issues the prefetch and then moves on. Um, so this allows it to keep ahead and the amount that it, it the amount ahead that it is <coughs> is set by this uh, tunable um, ZFS PD bytes max, the default is 50 megabytes. So this basically allows you to choose like how much memory do I want to use to, uh, um, to get as many uh, IOs going in parallel as I can. Um, and the advantage of putting this bigger is, is it's not just um, getting you know, a bunch of IOs to all your disks at the same time, but um, when if you have more IOs uh, queued, then we can issue to the disk, then we're able to sort them by offset. So if you're using spinning disks, this can, making this bigger can have a big per, uh, performance increase because uh, we're able to sort all the IOs and then issue them you know, in uh, offset order to the disk so that the disk doesn't have to seek the head as much. Um, and just to note that this, this prefetching that I'm describing is, is totally separate from predictive prefetching, which uh, tries to guess at which blocks you're going to need in the future based on the ones that you've already done. So like, oh, you read block one, two, three, four, you probably are gonna read five, six, and then seven. That's predictive prefetch. 
this is kind of, uh, I don't know, what's the opposite of predictive, like uh, omniscient prefetch. Yeah. Like we know what's going to happen. We know that we need these blocks um, and we're just issuing the reads for them a little bit sooner. So there's, there's no possibility of like wasted work uh, with this type of prefetching in contrast to predictive prefetch. Um, so I mentioned that uh, ZFS send and receive is unidirectional. Um, so that means, you know, ZFS send, it just emits the send stream. It isn't getting any data from the recipient system. So uh, one of the consequences of this is that um, the you have to provide on the command line all of the information um, that we need to send the right data to the target system. <coughs> so this is generally the responsibility of like the system administrator, or um, you know maybe uh, another layer uh, uh, on top of this. You know, like in our in our product, we have remote replication that's driven by you know a very complicated um, you know Java-based application stack that's actually orchestrating the connections. And of course, we aren't actually using SSH. We have like a private um, communication protocol. So you know, you know uh, I imagine a bunch of pro most products have something similar to that. So that upper layer would be responsible for figuring out like what to send. So in other words, telling it, you know, what's the most recent common snapshot? That's what you're going to use as the from snap. Um, what uh, so the send stream over the years has gotten some new um, over the wire features that both systems need to be able to support in order to communicate. So um, like t turning on enabling large blocks and embedded blocks, um, you need to know if those are supported on the receiving system. And if so, then enable them um, in the ZFS send. But the, the consequence of this is that it's insensitive to network latency. Um, this means that uh, you, know, you can use it for backups as well because you don't, you're the, send, the sending process isn't like talking to anyone. It's just kind of spitting it out there. So you can just spit it out and put it onto a tape or onto a hard drive that you're using for archival. Um, and then later on, take that file and feed it into the ZFS receive at a later date. Um, and it also allows like flexible distribution models where you can send from one system to another, to another, to another. Any questions about that? Yes. Is there any difference in doing a ZFS send and receive like in, in, in one command over SSH or mbuffer or mm -hmm. netcat and uh, outputting it to a file? I mean, of course there's a difference because the methodology is different. But what I mean is, is there a difference like in the number of bytes that get output mm. uh, because my question is like uh, if you're receiving into a system that's uh, a deduct pool mm -hmm. and you're receiving into a system that supports that you're I guess obviously only sending like uh, wi without rehydration mm -hmm. you know the, the deduct uh, differential the deduct data stream but what if you output to a file instead of of doing a send and receive mm -hmm. in one in one go does it also, is the byte stream that gets output also like in a deduct mm -hmm. form or would that be different? Yeah, that's a good question. So the data that's output from ZFS send is going to be the same whether you're putting it to a file or a, a <coughs> network stream or whatever um, because it doesn't, the ZFS send doesn't even know what you're doing with yeah. output. Um, so like semantically it's the same, but performance wise, you know, obviously performance wise, it could be very different. Um, specifically in terms of, of dedupe, the, um, it's going to be different. Like uh, you can actually, the, the receiving system is what's really implementing the dedupe because it's, the, the dedupe is pool, pool based, right? So it's like each pool has a giant hash table of all of the, checksums of all the blocks that are deduped within that pool. So when you receive, it's deduping it against what's already in that pool. Um, and uh, if you were, so you might think like, oh, if I did a ZFS send and I put the output to a file that's on that pool that I care about, then maybe that's gonna dedupe the same as if I did a ZFS send and put the output to ZFS receive on that pool. But that is not actually the case because um, ZFS dedupe works on a per block basis. So basically each block, it checks and sees, is there any other block in this pool with the same exact contents? Um, if you take the ZFS send stream <coughs> and put it into a file, 
then all of the like logical blocks within that send stream are not going to line up with the blocks in that file because there's like little headers in between each of them in the send stream. So in general, like it's not going to be able to dedupe uh, the like if you just take this ZFS send, put it into a file on a pool, it's probably not going to be able to dedupe that against other stuff in the pool. Let me rephrase my, my question. Um, let's say uh, on Monday mm -hmm. I add 10 video files of one gigabyte. They're mm -hmm. all identical. Mm -hmm. So on my dedupe pool, it's like only one gigabyte gets written, mm -hmm. okay? I snapshot on Tuesday. I make a differential between Monday and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, that differential deduped is only one gig and if it was hydrated it would be 10 gigs now i do a zfs send between monday and yeah. tuesday differential um you say it's it's the same whether it goes to the file or to ssh because it doesn't know what it goes to now is it one gig that is going out yeah, that's or is question. it 10 gigs that is going so out? so it depends yeah. um it, when you run zfs send there's a dedupe option so you can do zfs send dash capital d and then it will dedupe the send stream. But the way that that works is kind of different than the like normal on disk dedupe. So in your particular, so the way that it works is um, it's deduping only within the send stream. Right. So if there is duplicated data within the send, within whatever send operation that you're doing, then it would be like condensed away by, by the ZFS send dash capital D dedupe. Um, so in your case, like the differences between Monday and Tuesday are 10 copies of the same file. So it would detect that those are all the same and it would only send one copy of the file over the send stream. And then when you receive, you could receive that either into a dedupe pool, in which case it would just take the one gigabyte, or you could receive it into a non-dedupe pool and it would rehydrate it as it's being received. The, um, the downside of the way that this is done is like because it's unidirectional, right? we don't know what's on the other side. So when we do this, the send, it could be like if you had, instead of your example, <laughs> if you said on Monday, we, we put one file in, then on Tuesday, we put another copy of the same file. Then on Wednesday, we put another copy of the same file. So by Friday, you have, um, you know, seven copies of that file, but each of them are in a different snapshot. Then if you do, if you say like, just send Monday to Tuesday, it would say, great, here's the one terabyte file or one, one gigabyte file. If you send just from Tuesday to Wednesday, it would say, oh, here's this one, one gigabyte file, because we don't know that the other side already has deduped that so, away. So it does rehydrate, we could yeah. say. It rehydrates the byte stream, and then it's I mean, in it's not a direct replication of the source to destination, kind of knowing that both are deduped. So yeah. only sending what is what is uh, new, unique it's blocks. It's definitely not like a, a perfect, like, uh, let me figure out what you have, and I'll only send you things that you don't already have because uh, and that, that kind of the unidirectionality kind of implies that um, you know something like that certainly could be implemented um, it would be like it would be very different right because you'd be having a conversation between the two machines um, there'd be a lot more involved I, um, I think we have a hackathon project for tomorrow <laughs> congratulations yeah um, so the, the the ZFS send dash capital D like it does you can think of it as like dedupe light. Like in some cases, <laughs> it's going to be able to reduce it a lot. If you're using dedupe, then it's probably a good idea to use ZFS send dash D because it'll probably be able to reduce the send stream somewhat. But it's not. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to. Yeah. This is great because I didn't know of that option. Mm -hmm. And so n we do a lot of uh, put differentials in files mm -hmm. that we then uh, are sync in order to benefit from uh, gzip9 compression okay. over slow links. Mm -hmm. Is there in ZFS send, like there's a capital D for dedupe, is there like a, a way to compress the stream between the send and the receive? Um, so uh, another great hackathon project okay. idea. Um, this is actually uh, something that <coughs> we're hoping, we're getting some interns uh, this summer at, at Delphix, some, some college students, and we're hoping that uh, one of them, we'll get one of them to implement this. Um, this idea of uh, compress ZFS send and receive. Um, this has recently been made much, much easier to do by some work that George did that he'll be talking about um, called compressed arc, uh, which basically means that um, we store the data compressed in memory for like a longer period of time. Um, the idea of the compressed send and receive that we're talking about me would be that um, 
we would take the data as it is on disk. So if the data is compressed on disk already, we would just get that compressed data and then send that compressed data over the wire on ZFS send. And then when it's received, we take the compressed data and write that compressed data directly to disk. So if your data was already you know, LZ4 compressed, then it would go over the wire LZ4 compressed with like zero additional CPU overhead. Um, if it was already GZIP9 on, on disk, then again, GZIP9 over the wire. But if it was not compressed on disk? Then because sometimes then we, still we have slow links, you know? Because, yeah. okay, you, you want it non-compressed on disk because on your local NAS, you want it to be fast. But then you are replicating yeah. through so a one or two megabits uplink and bandwidth is your, is your yeah. uh, short resource. And so you want GZIP9 or the yeah. strongest compression you want ju just for that so sending to the, to the backup What system. I recommend there is to, um, rather than like putting it to a file and then GZIP9 it and then R syncing it, would be to just say like, you know, when you do this ZFS send pipe, just do ZFS send pipe GZIP pipe SSH. Um, that basically solves the whole, you know, and then on the other yeah. side, you know, SSH host, you know, G unzip. Yeah. Pipe ZFS. I, if receive. only we could resume them, but I know you're going to talk about We're that. We're going to get Thank to that too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, with the uh, dedupe uh, sending option, mm -hmm. um, it's a nice feature, but last I checked on, on Linux, it will lock your box. So yeah, there's a bug um, with that. <laughs> yeah, so they're aware of it and then they're working on it. I think, I think just on sending on, um, on Linux. I think side. it's just on sending on Linux. Yeah. I don't. I I think that's correct. Another question? Uh, no. Okay. Um, a small one. ZFS send is really performant, but it is very bursty. It can be. Yeah. It, for it sure. can. It, it it can be bursty. So, in in general, especially if you have a a higher bandwidth link, mm -hmm. um, including M buffer, is sort of mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we are trying. I, th I haven't done a ton of work on this, but um, increasing this uh, to I, I know. can have a similar effect to M buffer. There's also um, upcoming yet another um, layer of uh, like buffering that we're adding. Um, so I think that I need to figure out why this is not sufficient. It, this is not exactly equivalent to M buffer, um, I know, but I don't know, know exactly why, but I think that this new thing that we're adding is basically exactly identical to M buffer, and I think that'll allow you to solve the problem without an external tool. D did you have Hi, some, I some commentary on that? With this, um, admittedly, it's a few years ago. Thank you. It, I did some experimenting a few years ago with this, and the burstiness was on the receiving side. Okay. It was like it, yes. it kind of did like a five megabyte read yes. every transaction commit. Yes. So um, on the sending side, all that that I said is true. Maybe, maybe, maybe the, the issue doesn't even really exist on the sending side. On the receiving side, it definitely exists. That is solved. I'll be talking about that later. <laughs> uh, any Other more questions? questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, on, the, on the ZFS uh, send uh, in a incremental uh, way, the ZFS, uh, ZFS send, uh, send uh, the ID of the um, source of the um, snapshot source yeah. on the on ZFS receive. Uh, the um, the ID must be on the pool or the on the data set. Um, so when you're doing a ZFS send, uh, it's it it uses the um, the ID of the particular snapshot to identify it. So when you're doing, uh, mainly that's used when you do an incremental. Like when you do this incremental and you do the receive, we need to be really, really sure that on the receiving system, the snapshot that they have is actually the same as this Monday one that we're sending from. Otherwise, the receive is just going to end up giving you garbage. Um, so uh, it doesn't actually matter the name of the file system or the name of the snapshot. Um, there's internally like a, a GUID, a globally unique ID that we associate with this snapshot. And when we sent the Monday one first, when it was received here, it was assigned that GUID. And then when <coughs> we do this send, it's going to check that the, the from snap 
GUID that's in the send stream matches the GUID of the snapshot that you already have on the target system. Is that what you're asking about? Yes. But uh, have I missed it? It's it's depend on the on the pool. The, the pool doesn't snapshot because uh, the pool doesn't matter. So you could send it to the same pool. You could send it to a different pool. Um, that shouldn't matter. Yes, but uh, if I uh, if I send uh, Monday mm -hmm. on the destination pool on the an another data set, mm -hmm. uh, FS2, mm -hmm. and uh, I, uh, I incremental uh, send Monday on the FS3. Um, if it's a different it's file system, then it's a different snapshot. So like the 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 full name of the snapshot is like pool slash fs at Tuesday. If you have pool slash fs two at Tuesday, that snapshot has totally different contents, and it's unrelated to fs one at Tuesday. It just that they happen to be yes, taken at the same uh, time. Yes, but on a question with uh, more more force, more uh, f. Uh, uh, I I try that. Uh, I make a mistake. I try that on the. It works. Uh, I'm not I sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. Does Does anybody else have a? Oh. Okay. So there must have been something mismatched about what you had on the source versus what you had on the target. Um, let's take this offline and maybe we can try to diagnose your problem um, during the break or at the hackathon tomorrow. Back to where I was. Okay, uh, more questions or shall I move on? Great, lots of questions, I, I enjoy it. Um, so uh, this is just a small example. Um, there's a, a utility program called ZStreamDump, which uh, decodes the ZFS send stream and uh, can print out in various levels of detail um, what the contents of it are. Um, so this is an example showing, uh, you know, when you do a send, basically there's going to be a begin record. It tells, so this is getting to like the to good and from good, which I was just mentioning. Um, so like the from good says we're sending from the snapshot with this identifier, and it's going to check and make sure that's the same. If that doesn't match, then it's going to give you an error. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what else do I want to show you? There's a bunch of other record types. Um, and this shows you how many of them there are. And I'll give you an example of what they look like. So if you do zstreamdump-v, it'll actually show you every single record. Um, so you can see that most of the records are write records, uh, but there's also these object records. So an object record says, there's this object, it has number seven, it's this type, this is probably like a plain file. Um, it has a block size of 512, it has this big of a bonus buffer, and then it'll actually have the bonus, uh, the contents of the bonus buffer after that. The bonus buffer has some ZPL specific metadata. Um, and then uh, write records are kind of constitute the bulk of the data. Uh, the write record just says, I'm about to give you some data. You're gonna write that data to object 12 uh, at this offset and I'm giving you eight kilobytes. So, um, you know, as you can see here, like there's nothing about like you know, file ownership or like directories. There's, there's no difference between a directory and a file because they're all just objects. Any questions about that? Cool, so now we'll get to some exciting <coughs> new uh, features. So, oh, so first we'll talk about some features that are a little bit older but are that are unique to OpenZFS. So these are things that are like differentiate us from uh, what's in the proprietary Oracle ZFS. Um, this has been in for quite a while. Uh, there's uh, send stream size uh, estimation and progress monitoring. So this is useful if you're like, I'm doing an incremental send and it's been going all night and now it's the morning and it isn't done yet. Is it almost done or uh, is it not almost done? Because if it's not almost done, then I should probably kill this off because people are about to come into work and it's gonna make it slower or whatever. Um, so if you do ZFS send dash V, uh, it'll tell you the estimated size is 2.78 gigabytes. Um, if you're doing like a send dash capital R, then it'll give you the estimate for each individual snapshot and then also the total. And then um, it'll print out uh, every, I think it's every second, it shows, tells you like how, this is how much I've already sent, 
this is what snapshot I'm working on right now. Um, then you can uh, do like uh, what we've done with our product. Uh, you can use the dash capital P parsable option. It prints it kind of in a more uh, computer readable format. Um, and then you can hook that up into, you know, like a, a nice GUI that shows you your X percent done. What's uh, an E option? Um, e uh, enables embedded blocks to be sent. So uh, embedded blocks is another relatively new um, feature uh, of the on-disk format in general, uh, which allows for much better compression ratio of highly compressible data. So basically, if the whole block of data can be compressed down to fit in just the block pointer, which is about 100 bytes, then it'll take that compressed data, stuff it in the block pointer itself, and the block pointer doesn't actually point to anything. It just has the contents right embedded in it. Um, so this gives you both better compression ratio as well as the big benefit is um, less I.O. So like in our use case uh, at Delphix, we store a lot of databases. So uh, in Oracle, especially most databases, but especially Oracle databases, uh, when you create a new data file, it initializes the data file by writing a little header and footer on every single block. And this little header and footer um, compress down really well because the middle of the block is all zeros. So basically, we're able to compress it down into like less than 100 bytes. And then when they do this initialization operation, uh, we don't have to do it. We get like 100 times less number of IOs. Because instead of writing every data block, we just write the indirect block. It has all the data embedded inside of it. Um, and this is kind of like a quick and dirty benchmark that a lot of uh, uh, database admins like to do is like, how fast is my storage? Let me create a data file and see how long it takes. And so, you know, uh, this makes it go a lot faster <laughs> on our product. So with the E option, the, the send data stream will be less. Yeah, so the, with the E option, it's kind of like um, compressed, send, uh, compressed send, like you were asking about. Uh, but basically, uh, we were able to do this. The implementation of this is much easier than doing a full-blown compressed send and receive. Um, so uh, this is kind of like... Uh, a little bit of compressed send and receive with these embedded blocks. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I'm gonna, I think, I'm gonna go over these a little bit quickly so I can get to some more interesting stuff. So, um, we improve performance of ZFS send of um, files with holes, so like uh, sparse objects like ZVols and VMDKs, uh, by avoiding sending a bunch of stuff, and improving the improving it from uh, like O of N to constant time. Um, we also did this ZFS bookmarks thing. It lets you um, not have to keep around yesterday's snapshot on the sending system. Instead of keeping around that snapshot on the sending system, you keep this bookmark instead. Okay. Does that basically just store the... Yeah. Does that basically just store the GUID that you were talking about? Exactly, so it just stores that GUID and the creation time because that's all that's actually used when you do the ZFS send. We just look at the from snaps creation time and then we send it to it over. Uh, is it something that happens transparently uh, internally or is it something you have to no. change the way that you uh, you would, you ask would change the way that you're using it. Um, when you do the send, you would just specify a bookmark instead of a snapshot. So you do ZFS send dash I and then the name of the bookmark. But you would change your procedures so that um, you know rather than the normal way of doing it is like, uh, I send today's snapshot, and then I wait a day, and then I send from yesterday's snapshot to today's snapshot, and then I'm like, okay, great, yesterday's snapshot is done, I delete yesterday's snapshot, but I still have today's snapshot, and then I go again to the next day, and then I say, okay, so during that day, I, I had yesterday's snapshot was, you know, it was still there. Um, so I always have one snapshot on the sending system that's like only there because of send and receive all the time, regardless of if I'm actually running a send at that time. So you can imagine that like, if I keep doing this every day and then like this, the target system goes offline and then like a month later, I'm like, oh, well, it's a month later and I'm still holding on to this snapshot from a month ago that's actually taking up like gigabytes and gigabytes of space. Um, this solves that problem. So the, the new procedure would be like, I start, I send my snapshot, then I create a bookmark from the snapshot and then I delete the snapshot. So now I just have a bookmark, and I don't have any snapshot. Then to tomorrow, I send from that bookmark to today's snapshot. Mm -hmm. And then 
Again, I create a, create a bookmark of today's snapshot and then delete today's snapshot. So generally, you don't have any snapshots on your source system that are dedicated to this uh, replication. You just have a bookmark and the bookmark doesn't take up really any space. But it still has to keep the blocks that are... No, it doesn't need to keep the blocks. Because when you do a send, we only look at the two snap. So in other words, we only need to look at the data that's in the snapshot that you are sending, not the data that's in the snapshot that you're sending <coughs> from. Perhaps show it on the <coughs> diagram that we have. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to... Well, we're, we're going to eat into time. Let me see. Oh, I deleted yeah. those slides. Um, yeah, so, so like here, remember this diagram is showing you the blocks in the two snap. So this, uh, this is the snapshot that we're sending, but we aren't reading any data from the snapshot that we are sending from, so the incremental source, like yesterday's snapshot. All that we look, we just said, oh, yesterday's snapshot is at time five. That's all that we needed to know. So the bookmark just remembers yesterday's snapshot was time five. Do we need to manually delete the snapshots like we manually delete, uh, the, the bookmark like we manually delete the snapshots? Um, or they just Yeah, accumulate? like if, if you want it to be deleted, you have to delete it manually, but the space used by bookmarks is so tiny that it doesn't really matter. And there's not, if there's a thousand or a million snapshots, it's not going to affect performance? Uh, bookmarks. If you have like bookmarks, a thousand sorry. bookmarks or whatever, bookmarks. then no, it's, it's okay. not going to affect performance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, yes. Cool. This is all great stuff. So, um, do I still have like 15 minutes or are we? Okay. As long as you like. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, I'm talking now about some um, upcoming features. So all of these are things that I think I said this. Yeah. So all of these are things that uh, we implemented at Delphix. Um, they're open sourced. Uh, we published them on our GitHub page uh, a couple months ago. They're not upstream yet, though, so they're not really in uh, OpenZFS. We're working on this. We have a whole bunch of code reviews out um, to to get this uh, upstream because there's a lot of interrelated code changes. Um, so the first one is resumable send and receive. So this has been a long time coming. I know we've been talking about it for years and years. Um, so the problem that this is solving is that um, when the receive fails, we have to restart the whole send and receive process from the very beginning. So you know, it could fail because of like your network dies or the sending system reboots or the receiving system reboots or you hit control C by accident. I don't know if anybody does that, but um, in any case, the result is that all of the progress on that snapshot is lost. Um, so on the receiving system, we just say, oh, well, that receive didn't work, so I'm going to destroy all the stuff that I've already got, and we, you just got to restart from the be very beginning. So I mean, this is a real customer problem for us. This is why we implemented it. Um, we have a customer that like it took them 10 days to do a send, send and receive, and their MTBF of their network was about a week. So uh, it took like three times, you know, instead of taking 10 days, it took like 40 days because we had to keep restarting it every time their network died. Um, so the solution uh, is conceptually pretty straightforward. Um, we, when you do the receive and the receive fails, we just keep the state that we already have. And then we remember uh, what, uh, we basically we remember how far we got um, we remember that by recording the object and offset, and this works because, um, I don't know if you noticed in these previous slides, but the order of these records is, is sorted by object and then by offset. So it always goes forwards. So therefore, we can just remember the last received object and offset, and that tells us exactly everything that we have received and everything that is yet to be received. So now, I uh, implemented the sender is able to resume by picking up from this object and offset. Uh, basically, it's, it seeks directly to that object and offset. It doesn't have to like go through and read all the previous stuff or anything. Um, so it resumes basically in constant time. Um, so the way that this works, the way that you use it, um, send it is still unidirectional. So we still need to um, kind of manually uh, input to ZFS send um, all the parameters basically of what is on the receiving system. Um, the way to do this with, uh, with resuming is that on 
when the receive fails, um, it will still create the file system and it will create this new um, property called receive resume token. And this is basically like a, an opaque string with, with lots of you know random letters and numbers. But it essentially, it encodes the object and offset that we need to restart from, as well as some other information. And so then, you know, the either the sysadmin or the application that's driving this is going to pass this, get this token on the receiving system, and then input it into ZFS send on the sending system. So what this looks like in practice is you do ZFS send, you pipe it over the network or whatever to ZFS receive. You use this new receive dash s to indicate that you want it to save the state uh, if there's a failure. And then uh, if if the receive fails, you can use ZFS get to get this receive resume token, and then you paste that into ZFS send dash t, and then the token. So the token uh, tells it uh, not just where to resume from, but it also in it incorporates information about uh, which snapshot you want to send, what the incremental source is, what other features are enabled, like if you did the dash e to have embedded blocks. Um, so this makes it really straightforward to do the resume. Um, the only other uh, new interface is uh, if you do the receive dash s and we save the state, and then you realize, oh, like that sending system, like it just burst into flames and I'm never going to be able to resume it or whatever. So uh, then uh, you can abort the resumable send st receive state with this ZFS receive dash capital A, and uh, um, it discards the partially received state. Uh, under the hood, it basically it's doing like, uh, I don't know if, I if you guys are aware of this, but like when you do a receive, it's actually receiving the data into this invisible clone. So there's like, you do the receive into pool slash FS, it's actually receiving into pool slash FS slash percent receive. Um, and basically this just destroys that, uh, you know, pool slash FS slash percent receive. Um, and then there's like another special case for, the special cases depending on whether you were doing it incremental or full and stuff like that. Um, and, and of course there's all equivalent API calls um, in libzfs and libzfs core to drive this from your application. Any questions about this? Yes, Dan. Hold on, Dan. So while he's getting the mic, this is just showing um, when you do send dash v, okay. it'll also like decode Easy the song. token that um, that you provided. So this shows you like what all those things were that it's telling. My question would be about the performance. How does performance changes when you just add the percent minus s for mm -hmm. the receiver? Dan, oh. you might have a few people on the live stream being unhappy that you're <laughs> <laughs> directly <laughs> in the way. Sorry about that. But anyway, say that again. Yeah. So the the question was about um, when you do the. Uh, receive dash s is performance impacted? The answer is no. So basically for all of this, um, the performance is just the same as if you're doing it normally, except like when you do the send dash t, it restarts from that point. So um, there's really no performance impact. Um, the, only, the only impact would be kind of the obvious one of like, if you do the receive dash s and then it dies, then we're saving all that state. So it's using that space on disk so that you can resume at a later point in time. Um, and then obviously you would use the receive dash capital A uh, if you don't want it to use that space and you're not going to resume it. Um, but yeah, it's the receive, there's really like no changes to the receive dash S. Basically the receive dash S is just saying this is a resume a bowl receive. In other words, you will be able to resume it if it fails. Um, and so it's keeping track of that state. Um, the It's writing out uh, like the object and offset, um, but it's doing that like once every txg, once every transaction group. So it's not like um, you know every uh, every record that we get, we have to wait for like an additional write. It's basically keeping track of like um, this transaction group. This is the most recent object and offset, and then when we happen to sync it out, it'll write it out. So there is like a window where um, if you're doing a receive, uh, actually the well. There isn't a window. It's just like the fact of the matter is when you are doing a receive, if the receiving system, like if you pull the plug on the receiving system, then some of the data that was received won't have made it to disk yet. And the um, like the object and offset, the most recent object and offset will reflect that because it's updated, you know, as part of the transaction group syncing when we, uh, you know, write the new data to disk, we're also writing the new um, object and offset latest object and offset.
So performance is great. Um, great. This is just showing uh, the token, the, the data that's in it. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, it also includes the amount of data already received, and that's used to update the estimate. So when it gives you the new estimate, it's saying like, oh, I'm doing a send, it's resuming, and now the estimate is gonna be smaller because it knows, like, it computes the, f the estimate of doing the whole thing is whatever, 20 megs, but you've already received, you know, nine megs of it, so there's 11 megs left. The nice thing about that is like, at least the way that we, the way that it happened to get integrated in our product, there are basically no changes above, uh, no changes to the like uh, progress monitoring stuff because this just kind of worked. Um, oh, so this is just an example of showing, you can do zstream dump dash v and then um, uh, if, you're, if this is a resuming send stream, it's gonna tell it I'm resuming from this object and offset. And then the first object and the first write record are gonna be for that object and offset. Um, and of course we have to include this information so that when you do the receive, it knows that you're receiving a valid um, stream. In other words, like you didn't, you didn't somehow concoct a uh, token that says to start from a later point than we actually already have. So that, you know, we always wanna make sure that there's no way to like misuse it and get uh, uh, incorrect um, file system in the end. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit through this so that we don't take forever. Um, part of this work, we added a checksum to every record in the send stream so that uh, if the receive dies in the middle, then we know that everything that we've gotten is uh, the correct data. Um, so this is another initial layer of check something on top of like whatever is already in your transport of um, you know maybe TCP or whatever. TCP has like a really tiny, it's like 16, bit, 16 bits or something checksum. This is a full ZFS, you know, 128, uh, 128, no, 256 bit checksum, but yeah. Um, okay, so there was a question, or oh yes, you were mentioning that, um, and you were kind of reinforcing that uh, when you do a ZFS receive, uh, it can get like really bursty. Um, and M buffer on the receive side can really help this. So uh, the we, we also noticed this, and we um, actually diagnosed the problem, and it turns out this can happen really easily um, if, Yes, if, uh, especially if you're doing an incremental receive and it's of record structured data. So it's you have a big file, um, you've modified only some of the blocks within that file and you're receiving that. So this happens a lot if you have like a database or like a ZVOL or a VMDK file, something like that. The problem is that, um, uh, well, so okay, before we get to the problem, the when we um, process each record we have to write that into the file. And writing that requires that we read the indirect block. And this is kind of, this isn't necessarily a problem, it's just a fact, like we have this tree of blocks. Let me go back. We have a tree of blocks. If we wanna write and update this block, at some point we have to read this block in so that we can modify it and point the new pointer here and the old pointer still points there. Um, but the problem is the way that we're doing it, which is, that this read is happening synchronously. So uh, what's happening in the ZFS receive process is we get a record from the network and then we um, issue the read to disk for this indirect block. Now the problem, we wait for the read of that indirect block to complete and then finally we can continue on with the write which basically means just um, pushing the data into the DMU. But this write there's no actual I.O. associated with it because it's a like asynchronous write and we're gonna seek out those changes at the end of the transaction group. So we keep doing this and um, if many of these uh, read, if many of these writes have to wait for a read of the indirect block, then you'll end up not getting what I promised you, which is um, you go at the full bandwidth of your storage. Instead, you'll be going at the um, IOPS in of your storage and you'll just be doing one read, it'll be like, let me do one read, wait for that read to complete. Great, now you can do one write. Do another read, great, that read is done, now you can do one write. So it'll be very, it can get very, very slow. Solution is 
Uh, we added another thread to the receive process. So there's now two threads. The main thread is getting the data from the network um, and then uh, enqueuing the record uh, on a queue in memory. So uh, what we do is we get the data, from, we get the record from the network. Now we issue the read IO for the indirect block, but we're not gonna wait for that. We're just gonna issue it as a prefetch. We don't wait for that to read to complete. And then we enqueue the record onto uh, a queue with a bounded length. Now the worker thread is gonna dequeue the record, pop it off of the queue, and then wait for the read of the indirect block to complete, and then um, copy the data <coughs> into the DMU. So because this queue allows us like a certain amount of time between these two operations, um, after kind of the first one waits, then enough records will have built up that by the time we get to the next one, it won't actually have to wait. So typically this wait will be uh, you know, a no-op because we'll already have uh, completed that read of the indirect block. Um, so we, we created like a little benchmark for this and it actually went six times faster. Um, and uh, on real world uh, customer database, it went twice as fast. Um, so that's a pretty huge performance increase. Any questions about this? You oh. mentioned, sorry, you mentioned that uh, with this improvement, no more need of M buffer. So your benchmark kind of confirms that this or M buffer is equivalent performance. Therefore, we can completely ditch M buffer because yeah. it's been performing awesomely M buffer in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, I, um, I. I claim that that is probably the case. Um, I would encourage you to test it and um, and let me know how that turns out. Um, you know, we were not previously using mBuffer. Um, we did have some buffering in our like network stream stuff, but not that much. Um, so mBuffer mBuffer wouldn't mBuffer wouldn't really solve this problem 100%. Um, you know, it decouples, it would decouple the network from the disk performance, but the problem with, the problem that I described here is that the disk performance is really bad. Um, so this uh, solution both decouples the network from the disk as well as actually solving the disk performance problem. Um, so it, it may, you know, I, I'm not gonna claim to have kind of conclusively looked at every problem that mBuffer solves. Um, I think that this will address those issues, but uh, I would I would gather data first before you know unilaterally um, disregarding your M buffer. And and when is this feature and resumable send receive going to be available? Um, I don't know, <laughs> like uh, a couple months. I've been working on it. I, I've upstreamed a few a few parts of this. Um, I think this. You can get it from our repo now. Yeah, you can get it from our repo now and kind of like pull it into your own. Um, but this will be going upstream probably, like I'm, I'm gonna say in like two months, it'll be upstream. And then another couple months for it to go into the distributions? Is um, that usually the time it takes? It'll go, it'll go almost immediately into FreeBSD um, current, um, which is like kind of the bleeding edge. And then um, to go into a FreeBSD distro, it, like a, a, a release version of FreeBSD is several, like depending on if you're waiting for a full release or patch release, like it's probably gonna be several months, like six months or something um, from there. And Omni also supports um, Yeah, Omni also has like a OmniOS bloody release, which is like very, very current. I think they usually update every two weeks. Um, and then they have a, I don't know how often do they do uh, major releases? Like every half year. Okay, so then they do every six months a, um, uh, uh, like supported release. Thank you. If I have um, a very fragmented pool, mm -hmm. ZFSN is um, object based. So is it the best choice to defragment the pool or am I better off using rsync if I can afford the longer downtime? Um, so I I if you're you want to defragment the pool by essentially rewriting all of the data. Um, well, ZFS send and receive is going to be a much better choice because it preserves your snapshots, 
right? So if, if you are using snapshots or clones, then ZFS Center Receive is really the only way to replicate that in the new pool or like if you're just doing it to the same pool. Um, if you don't care about that for some reason, you know, you're not using snapshots, then um, send and receive versus rsync, it should be essentially the same. Um, at, at least for like the initial, you know, the, the first full send or full rsync is gonna be pretty much the same. If you're needing to do like incrementals after that, then um, obviously send and receive is gonna be faster than the rsync, but if you're just saying let's take downtime and mm. do the whole rsync, then it would be the same to use send and receive or rsync. Okay, thanks. And, and they both kind of work like, uh, you know, they're gonna take each file, read each file, write out each file, so the files will be like as contiguous as possible in either case. Yeah, but preserving the snapshots mm -hmm. might be necessary in terms of preserving the feature that snapshots bring, but by preserving the snapshots, sometimes we also preserve the fragmentation. Because if I have a 300 megs Photoshop file and it's been changed every day for 40 days and I have 40 snapshots, now when I want to read that Photoshop file, I have to read parts that are scattered all over the VDEV or pool because some of that file is in day one, some of that file that's been modified in day two has to be read from the place in the disk where it is from snapshot day two and day three and four and five. So, of course, if we want to preserve the, fe the feature of mm -hmm. the snapshots, we have to do that, but compared to just like copying the data without preserving the snapshots, we would end up with a 300 meg file that could be a continuous uh, write, uh, uh, yeah, mean, I mean contiguous. And preserving the snapshots would actually preserve the fragmentation. Yeah. Is that a correct Th that's understanding? That's probably true. Um, I would say, like the, I and I would say that the initial problem of that fragmentation occurring to begin with is going to happen regardless of if you have snapshots or not. Like if you have a file that's updated blockwise, you know, like a database file. I don't know about Photoshop, but if because it does of the copy same on thing, write, yeah, because of copy on write, like part of the part of, part of the files were in a long time ago and part of it was written more recently, so they were allocated at different times and written to different places on disk. Right? The trade-off that you're making there of a copy and write file system versus a write-in-place file system is the writing is generally faster because it can be to wherever there's a big chunk of free space, but the reading can be more um, scattershot. But a ZFS send and receive without preserving snapshots just of the latest state of mm -hmm. the pool would then reconstruct the files uh, in a contiguous yeah. fashion? Yeah. Or, okay, so without fragmentation. Yeah, just like our sync, it'll, it'll reconstruct it like as contiguously as possible. So if you're going into an empty pool, then it's gonna be super contiguous. So could we not preserve the snapshots, but preserve the bookmarks? Um, the bookmarks wouldn't really no. help you there. Because the, the thing that you're talking about is like, am I sending a full send of the latest version Okay. Versus, am I sending the old a full send of the oldest version and then an incremental from there to the next, then an incremental from there to the next, incremental? So incremental. For a true defragmentation, we kind of need to lose the snapshots. If we do a ZFS send and receive of the late of the of the, of the yeah. latest uh, state of the data set, yeah, and then all files are written contiguously. If I have a, yeah. a million three hundred megs file, so they're all written three hundred megs and then the mm -hmm. next and then the next. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So this is one of the reasons that like. We, uh, because you know, our product Adelphix depends really heavily on ZFS snapshots and clones. There, you know, there is really no optimal or like, there's no really great way to lay out that data so that it perf is going to perform great regardless of which snapshot or which clone you're accessing. So that's why we've really put more of our effort into um, getting good pool, good performance even when you have a fragmented pool. Um, and in reducing fragmentation overall, rather than um, like optimizing after the fact or like uh, you know defrag or things like that. So George is going to talk about some of the work that we've done in that space. I think after the break. Thank you. Cool. And does this one work? Uh, um, and it doesn't apply to Flash. It only applies to disk. <laughs> yeah, obviously Flash random read write is is great. So not a big deal. <coughs> Cool. So um, this is kind of all the prepared slides that I had. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, continue answering questions for as long as you guys can stand um, uh, about send and receive or open ZFS or kind of any other ZFS features, if there are any. 
Any questions? No? Okay, great. Let's go get some snacks. And uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. After the break, George will talk. So I think it's probably a good time everyone uh, gets caffeinated up and uh, has some coffee, uh, a quick break, and then, uh, yeah, we'll be back for George. So if anyone else on the live stream also wants to ask questions, feel, f feel free to uh, use Twitter uh, with a hashtag OpenZFS. Uh, you can send us questions and I'll read them out for Matt or George or anyone else.